Diesel engines today are far removed from the noisy, harsh, smoky units of yesteryear. Sophisticated engine design brought about by emission regulations and the growing demand for diesel engines in saloon cars have seen to that. So, when the initial specification for the Freelander was being drawn up, the Land Rover engineers didn't have to look far for a suitable diesel engine, because in the same stable was the Rover L-Series unit. To see just how eminently suitable the L-Series really is, let's take a few moments to review its pedigree. The lineage can be traced back through the T-Series petrol engine to the direct injection MDI, which was launched in the mid-80s. The MDI engine proved to be just as reliable in service as its designers claimed it would. But with the introduction of more stringent exhaust emission regulations, it was clear that it wouldn't meet the future criteria in its existing form. So the engineers combined their talents to design an engine which had the attributes of the MDI, but which would meet all foreseeable emission regulations, and the 2-litre L-Series was born. Design and development work started in 1990, and Rover's investment in advanced development technology paid off when the first running engine was achieved by August 1992. They incorporated the well-proven bottom end of its predecessors and the piston design first seen in the Land Rover TDI engine. To meet the design criteria for performance, economy and emission control, leading consultants AVL in Austria and suppliers such as Bosch played a key role in its development. A sophisticated electronic control system was designed to ensure that the new engine receives optimum fueling under all running conditions. Development work went on through 1993 and 94. About 380 pre-production engines were built and 35,000 testbed hours and 1.2 million miles later the design team expressed their satisfaction with it. Production started and the L-Series was introduced in the Rover 600 at the beginning of 1995. It was an instant success. Performance was first class. With the turbocharger and intercooling, the car engine developed 105 PS at 4,200 RPM and a maximum torque of 210 Newton meters at only 2,000 RPM. In the Rover 600, it gave a remarkable 0 to 60 acceleration time of 11 seconds and a top speed of 114 miles an hour, and it met all foreseeable emission regulations. And it's worth pointing out that for this engine to be acceptable in a high-class saloon car, it needed to have a high degree of refinement. The engine proved to be very smooth and have good drivability throughout the speed range and excellent fuel economy. All in all, the L-Series has proved itself to be the success its designers said it would. So when the Freelander was conceived, what better diesel to power it than this? For the first time, Land Rover has opted for a transverse installation. This layout is ideal for mating with the new transmission assembly. Development testing showed it to be more than equal to the task of continuing the proud Land Rover tradition of rugged reliability. In the Freelander installation, turbocharging and intercooling are retained to give excellent power output and fuel economy. So, let's look at this remarkable engine in more detail. We'll start with the external features. This poly V-belt drives a number of engine ancillaries. The brake system vacuum pump is integral with the alternator, so it drives both of those. Then there is the combined power steering pump and water pump, and the air conditioning compressor when air conditioning is fitted. Behind the timing cover, a toothed belt drives the single overhead camshaft. On the manifold side is the turbocharger with its wastegate and the EGR valve. An interesting development here is this water jacket around the pipe taking exhaust gas to the EGR. It's fitted to cool the gas before it reaches the inlet manifold and improve the EGR's function in reducing exhaust emissions. A depression limiting valve is included in the breathing system it must be connected the right way round to ensure there isn't a pressure build-up in the crank case. On the other side of the engine, this alloy housing is a water-cooled oil cooler. As well as helping to cool the oil, its insulation also provides an enhanced heater performance. Directly above it is the Bosch high-pressure fuel injection pump. We'll be talking about the fuel system in more detail in a minute, 
But one point I'll mention now is that pump timing is similar to 300 TDI. Timing pins instead of the DTI method we used in the past. One major difference from the systems you already know becomes apparent if you have to remove a pump. After turning the engine to TDC number one, you must lock the pump shaft by removing this washer and tightening the bolt. If you don't do that, the pump shaft will be free to turn, the timing will be lost, and you'll have to return the pump to the manufacturer's agent to be re-timed. You can also see the Bosch injectors on this side. They have a two-stage operation for quietness and to provide efficient atomization for emission control. They can't be pressure tested or adjusted in service. You'll notice that number one injector is longer than the other three and has an electrical connection. It contains a needle lift sensor, just one of the many sensors in the control system signaling information to the ECM. Direct injection was chosen for the L-series engine. In indirect injection systems, fuel is injected into separate combustion chambers in the cylinder head. Direct injection means that the fuel is injected directly into combustion areas in the top of the pistons, and it gives a number of advantages. Improved efficiency, better fuel economy, more power, and easier starting. At the flywheel end of the engine, this cover conceals a tooth belt. You can see that it takes a drive from the rear of the camshaft to the fuel injection pump. This clever design means that you can remove the camshaft drive belt to work on the front of the engine without disturbing the pump timing. The pump drive belt must be renewed at the same time as the camshaft belt, and the correct procedure is essential to maintain precise pump timing. Now let's look inside. We'll start with the aluminium alloy cylinder head. It's a completely new design. The overhead camshaft is held in place by a bearing ladder which has been line bored with the head. Underneath the camshaft, hydraulic tappets enhance the refinement of the engine, as well as eliminating the need for valve clearance adjustment. A multi-layer steel head gasket is fitted. Expensive maybe, but the rover engineers considered it money well spent to ensure reliability. Three thicknesses of gasket are available to obtain the correct clearance above the pistons. One, two or three holes identify the gasket thickness. The carefully developed shape of the combustion chambers is crucial to the high efficiency of the L-series design. It's a re-entrant circular design with a central raised pip. And you may have noticed the near vertical position of the injectors earlier. This is to aim the spray downwards onto the pip for maximum effectiveness in mixing the air and fuel. A very interesting development is used in the manufacture of the conrods. It's called fracture splitting. The big end cap is no longer machined off, it's literally broken off. The advantage of this is that the cap is a perfect match to the conrod. It will only fit its own conrod and can't be fitted the wrong way round when the rod is on its journal because the retaining bolts are offset. Another ingenious bit of design is the wedge-shaped small end. The surface area of the broadside at the bottom is more than adequate to take the downward thrust of the piston on the firing stroke. And by narrowing the top, it allows more freedom to design the piston for maximum strength and heat dissipation. The pistons themselves are graphite-coated aluminium alloy with three rings. The cylinder bores have a micro-honed finish for good oil control and minimum emissions. Now the bottom end. The sump is an aluminium alloy casting for stiffness and it has a baffle to improve the efficiency of the internal breathing system. And you can see the strong five bearing crankshaft. Thrust washers at the centre main provide end float control. The inbuilt strength of the crankshaft is enhanced by having 11 millimetres of journal overlap. That's the distance by which the main bearing journals overlap the big ends. As we said before, the bottom end is immensely strong and ideally suited to the Freelander application. The oil pump is driven by the nose of the crankshaft. It forces pressurised oil through the full flow filter 
to the main oil gallery, from which drillings directed to the five main bearings and to oil squirt jets for piston cooling and gudgeon pin lubrication. A vertical drilling at the back of the block contains a restrictor which reduces oil pressure to the full length drilling in the cylinder head to the camshaft journals and the tappets. A thermostatic valve is fitted in the oil pump body. The valve is closed during warm-up, but when the oil reaches a predetermined temperature, the valve opens to allow it to flow through the oil cooler. Next, a word about cooling. As we mentioned earlier, the water pump is mounted externally on the rear of the power steering pump. The coolant flow is conventional, and the system has an excellent flow rate for enhanced durability and optimum heater performance. In the final part of this program, we'll look at the Electronic Diesel Control System, or EDC for short. It's a highly sophisticated means of controlling the amount of fuel that is injected into the engine under all conditions, starting, idling, full throttle, and so on. This is to ensure maximum performance and economy with minimum exhaust emissions. At its heart is a sophisticated ECM, which is located behind the battery. It receives signals from a number of sensors in and around the engine, analyzes those signals and sends instructions to the fuel injection pump, the EGR, and the glow plug system. We've already mentioned the needle lift sensor in the injector. It signals the ECM the instant the injector starts to open. Let's see where some of the other sensors are. This is the flywheel sensor to signal engine speed and crankshaft position. This is the coolant sensor, the air temperature sensor, and this is the boost pressure sensor. There are two sensors inside the fuel injection pump itself. One signals fuel temperature and the other the quantity of fuel being injected. While we're talking about the pump, it incorporates a solenoid valve which together with the injector lift sensor makes automatic changes to injection timing to suit driving requirements. By the way, don't be alarmed if you hear a slight buzzing sound from the pump when the ignition is switched on. This is normal operation of the solenoid valve. So far, we haven't mentioned the throttle pedal. This too has gone electric. A potentiometer mounted on the pedal registers the movements made by the driver's foot and signals these to the ECM. As we've said, the ECM is already receiving signals from all the other sensors and is in the unique position of interpreting the driver's demands. So there's no mechanical link between the accelerator pedal and the injection pump. It's all done by electrical signals and hence the term drive by wire. As you can see, it all adds up to an extremely sophisticated system which can instantly react to changing conditions in the best interests of performance, economy and emissions. And of course, it has the added benefit of being able to compensate automatically when components wear during service. Incidentally, there is a malfunction indicator lamp on the instrument panel. If it illuminates while driving, it indicates that a fault has occurred in the EDC system. In most cases, the ECM then enters a limp home mode. There will be reduced engine performance and a lack of throttle response, and you'll need test book to diagnose the problem. It's also worth mentioning that the ECM has a sophisticated engine immobilization system built into it. When the vehicle's alarm system is armed, the engine starting and fueling systems are immobilized and can only be reactivated by authorized means. Before we finish, a word about some scheduled servicing requirements. The engine oil and filter should be changed at the first 6,000 mile service. But after that, because the engine is so clean running, they only need changing at 12,000 mile intervals. At each 12,000 mile service, you should also change the fuel filter and check the condition of the external drive belt. At 24,000 mile intervals, there is some additional work. Change the air cleaner element and check the crankcase breathing system. The camshaft and fuel injection pump drive belts must also be changed at specified intervals. By the way, one thing you don't have to do is to check the tappets. As we've said before, they are hydraulic and don't need adjusting. That completes this program on the exciting L-Series diesel. It's an engine which has already proved its performance and reliability in service, 
and we're confident that it will prove to be an ideal power unit for Land Rover's exciting new Freelander.